Hi, welcome everyone. Um, good to see you after lunch. Um, I'm Adrian de Groot. I'm going to talk about Calamares, a Linux system installer. Um, if you're here because of the originally scheduled talk, tough luck. Um, we hope this will be interesting nonetheless. And if you're a FreeBSD person, I have no idea why you're here. Um, I'm a FreeBSD person myself, uh, but I spend my working hours writing a Linux system installer. Um, so the purpose in general, as long as Linux or FreeBSD isn't installed on all computers, all desktops, uh, all consumer devices delivered, until it's installed from the factory, pre-installed, we're still stuck with this situation where we've got to go from a CD and our computer, and we want to get to a point where we've got the same computer with Linux on it, right? You've repla replaced whatever else was on there with, with Linux. And along the way, you're probably going to run into having to deal with flash or disks and uh, partitioning stuff. Uh, so you need to install Linux, or you need to install your operating system of choice. Um, the big five Linux distros have their own installers, right? The big five uh, being Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian. I should have named Debian first. Um, Arch, and uh, but Arch doesn't have an installer. Um, and there's one. There's one more. I know that. Yeah, let's let's go for Gen two. Um, maybe there maybe there's six. Anyway, the big Linuxes all have their own installers. Those installers are geared towards installing that big distro. But the boutique distros, the little ones, don't have an installer of their own. Um, Anaconda for Fedora is a fine installer to get Fedora installed. But if you're making a Fedora respin or a derivative of some sort, it doesn't, quite, it doesn't necessarily quite match. Um, so that's where the need for a, s a different installer or another installer comes in. Um, there's tons of boutique distros. Um, who runs one of the big five here in the room? Who runs something amazingly obscure that no one has heard of? Uh, some people have heard of. Okay, so we, we, you know, we've, we've got about 10 people here in the room that are outside of the, the mainstream. That's good. Then, then you're sort of my maybe target audience. And maybe you've used my stuff, but if you're a cubes guy, you probably don't trust my code. I wouldn't either. <laughs> um, anyway, why are there even these boutique distros? Well, that's because the big five, while amazing general purpose operating systems or general purpose distributions, uh, they don't necessarily answer the specific needs of a well-defined target audience. So you get derivatives and spins. Uh, you get Linux is catering to a specific audience. You get Linux distros that use specific technologies or specialized technologies. And you also get Linux distros that are created just because. I mean, there are distros out there that exist because somebody wanted a different color scheme. That's fine. Um, I am not going to judge anyone's reasons for wanting to create their own Linux distro. Choice is good. Um, I do want to highlight one of my favorite boutique distros that's called the Ames Desktop. It's a, it's a Debian derivative. Um, it's the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, I think. Um, it collects mathematical software, all the software you need as a professional mathematician, and it sticks it on one Debian uh, Debian-derived uh, distribution. And they send around DVDs, actual install media. Um, the reason for this is that, uh, that the internet isn't necessarily all that good all across Africa. And so the African uh, mathematical uh, faculties at universities that need the software find it more convenient to have a DVD. And I think that's a really cool distro. It's got a specialized audience, specialized tools, and existing installers don't specifically cater to it. So that's why these Linux distros, uh, these boutique distros exist. Um, 
a distro delivers basically a bunch of packages and an installer CD. That's the way I look at it. Um, if you are an actual distro person here in the room, you probably have a different view because a distro provides support and community and, and other things. But from my point of view, you're basically, in the end, providing an, a live ISO image and there needs to be a button. Install this onto the, the computer. To actually do the installation, uh, there's a whole bunch of steps that need to be dealt with. Um, certainly, if you've got a, a brand new blank machine, uh, you're going to have to uh, deal with getting the right bootloader on there. Um, probably something like Grub. You're going to need to uh, repartition. Thankfully, we now, almost everybody uses GPT, so we can at least rely on a, on a sensible uh, disk format or a disk partitioning uh, thing. You're going to have to get your kernel, and then once the kernel, once you've got sort of that basic stuff done, then you get the customization part of your your distro. All the packaging. If you happen to be a, a distro that is delivering the i3 window manager, then you're going to install i3 into the target system and set it up so that you know when the user starts the system, they get i3. Are there any i3 users in the room? All right. Um, that's five out of 90. I bet. It's, it's good to keep track of some numbers. Um, so a Linux installer, one that is going to install the distro for you, has to deal with all of those things. Um, and you, you can look at it in, in a couple of different ways. Um, if you really start with a CD and want to end up with a running machine, you've got to do all the things. Deal with the bootloader, do the partitioning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but not everything is delivered as, uh, well not every machine is that helpless. Um, there are, in fact, uh, hardware vendors that will ship you a Linux machine. Um, Slimbook is one uh, that's a Spanish laptop uh, distributor. So in that case, you've already got Linux on there. But obviously, it's not got you on it. It's some standard live user. Um, and so there's post-delivery configuration to be done. Um, the vendor that makes this stuff also has pre delivery. They've got to set up the system to get there. So we can sort of con uh, distinguish between the whole, the, the do all the things idea from two kinds of, of OEM uh, setup. Right, all of this was extremely generic so far. I've just told you about, you know, Linux distros and getting stuff installed. Um, Kalamatas tries to, so if you're not using one of the big five installers, there's Kalamatas, and this is sort of where I switch into sales pitch mode. Um, so Kalamatas tries to be the base for a flexible uh, installer. Uh, it's brandable. That means that if you are producing your own distro, you actually can easily get your, your visuals in there so that it looks like someone is installing your stuff and not Ubuntu, for instance. Um, Kalamatas is very... Uh, um, I, I make a point of it being independent of distros and independent of desktops. I'm wearing a KDE t-shirt. Um, that's because I'm a KDE person. Um, but Kalamatis is not a distro, uh, an installer for KDE distros. It's an installer for everyone. Um, it's used by all those derivatives, all those boutique distros that I showed on the first page. Those are Debian derivatives. Those are Fedora derivatives. Those are Arch derivatives. So it does cover the entire spectrum. Um, and so for the rest of my talk, I'm, I'm going to be sort of talking about how Kalamatis does these things, what it looks like. Um, and we're not going to deep dive if you want, if you have extensive questions afterwards, talk to me later. Um, Kalamatis is distro and desktop agnostic, but it has to pick something, some technologies to use. So it is a, a Qt based application. Uh, it uses Qt widgets and QML uh, for the actual UI parts. Um, I get bug reports about this as well because when you run it in a uh, GTK based desktop, it looks slightly off. Um, that's acceptable, I guess. Uh, and also something we can sit down to fix at some point. But 
Anyway, it uses KPM Core, which is a KDE framework or a KDE library for uh, doing partition management. Um, that in turn uses S SF disk uh, as a backend. So there's a couple of layers uh, for d actually dealing with partitioning, because partitioning is the hard part, actually. Um, Kalamatis uses Python for extensibility. Much of it is in C++. Uh, that's the, the, the core bits. Um, but it turns out that I cannot foresee everything that distros want to do. And so that's why there's a Python uh, API inside it. You run Python scripts inside the installer. Probably not great for security, but you know if you're if you're doing an, an installer, installers are going to mess up your machine anyway. So that's why I don't. I'll, I'll stop talking about security. Um, it uses Python for extensibility. That also means that distros can experiment a bit. They can quickly write Python code uh, and see if that does the thing they want uh, within the installer. Um, I find that it, Python has a lower barrier to entry than C++ does. Um, <coughs> even lower barrier to entry is the configuration language. We just use YAML. Everything is straight, flat YAML files. And then there's a whole bunch of modules that do the actual work. Um, Kalamata's configuration is split up into, into three layers. Uh, there's sort of the overall show of what are we going to do for installation. Um, that tells you things like uh, which modules actually have to run. I've got an example later. Um, <coughs> there's specific branding configuration that handles the visuals, and then individual modules have their own uh, configuration as well. Um, so here's an ex example from uh, a Manjaro install. Uh, install disk. I've, I've edited it down a bit. Um, but basically, this is the settings file for Manjaro. And it says, we're Manjaro at the top. And then in order to install Manjaro, you've got to show the user a couple of things. You've got to say hi to them. Welcome to Manjaro. You're installing Manjaro, remember? Um, you've got to let the user partition the disk, pick where the distro is going to be installed. Uh, it's a good idea at to ask the user um, what's going to be your login name. Um, and while you're there, you ask them for their password as well, and you check that the password is a sufficiently strong one, that kind of stuff. Um, and then you give them a summary saying, this is going to happen. Please click install. Um, <coughs> and then it gets to the work part where it redo redoes a bunch of these things. It partitions the disk. It mounts the disks that it just partitioned, and it starts unpacking the entire file system. So this is sort of the high-level overview of to install Manjaro, do this. If you have a different distro, you can use different <coughs> different steps. And if you're doing one of those OEM-type configurations, you would skip partitioning, for instance. You don't have to partition if the disk is already written full of stuff. If we move downwards a little uh, to the branding part, um, the branding part uh, has a bunch of, of visual things that it defines. Uh, this basically, once again, tells you that it's called Manjaro. That's a user visible string. Um, it supports, uh, I should mention, Kalamatis supports translations into 52 languages. Um, I'm very grateful to the crowdsourced uh, translation community um, because that means that you can switch it into Danish or Swedish and do the thing. You can switch it into Arabic, and you can do the thing. Um, some of these languages, I can actually check that the translations make sense, and some of them I can't. I cannot read Marathi, for instance. Um, so I'm trusting the translators to do a good job there. But it's wonderful that they're there. Um, <coughs> there's some graphic stuff. There's a slideshow defined. The slideshow is QML. QML is a very powerful language. You can do lots of things in QML. Many, peop many distros just use it to do a slideshow. You know, you get the, the welcome, we're a wonderful Linux desktop, blah, blah, you know, slideshows like that. But in QML, you can do more. Um, you can simply plug in a game. Um, so I've got at least one demonstration, uh, live ESO, where you can play uh, same game 
a little game with marbles that drop down uh, while waiting for it to install. You know, you can, you can use the power of, of QML to, to make installation fun. Um, moving another step downwards in uh, the stack, uh, this is the configuration specifically of the unsquash uh, module. Um, so you're going to be telling, um, once you've partitioned and once you've mounted this disks, you're going to be writing information into them. And this just says, well, grab that uh, file system, that squashfs, and unpack it into the root of the, the target. And once you've done that, do this one. And so this gives the distro maintainer also the opportunity to um, they they can they can share various file systems they can split things up uh, whatever way they like. This example just unpacks a squashfs. Um, it will also unpack tarballs. It can copy uh, entire file systems. If you happen to have a block for block image of a file system, it will. Uh, you can also tell it to dd that. Uh, over top of something. It's kind of a risky way to do it, but um, you can. So there's a, a, a lot of different configuration possibilities just for unsquash. So an important part in, in sort of my daily Kalamatis work is dealing with downstream, dealing with the distros that use uh, Kalamatis. And I'm happy that we have a, a really good relationship. Um, I get paid to work on Kalamatis, but I'm not paid by any of those distros. And my instructions are, do what the distros want. So that's sort of a, a weird service, uh, yeah, service to the boutique, boutique distros everywhere. Um, I like it because it gets me food and it improves the world for all those boutique lin Linux distros. Um, Kalamatis provides the framework. Uh, I. Produce the so I produce the code. I publish it. It's all GPL v3. Um, distros uh, basically package up Kalamatis plus a configuration and use that uh, on their uh, on their ISO images. Um, distros pr pr propose new features all the time. Um, they want to do something new with user management or. Uh, they want to do special package handling, or they've realized that Firefox translations, Firefox translations are important, but lots of distros package them separately from Firefox, the executable. Um, so yes, there's something in Kalamatis to specially handle translation packages, so that if you install your system in German, you will get Firefox in German as well. Distros pr propose these features, they get de developed somewhere. Because there's the Python, mod Python API for extensibility, the distros can actually write the modules themselves and say, here is a module that does what we want. That gets, uh, once that develop has development has happened somewhere, things get moved upstream. I, I try to collect things from downstream as much as possible. And when I collect them, I generalize and document and then make sure that it's usable for others. So I try to, to sort of expand the framework when I can s with useful features for the rest of the world. Sometimes distros do stuff that isn't applicable elsewhere. Um, at that point, I go like, okay, you can keep your own stuff. Um, but most of the time, things are, uh, are upstreamed. Um, like some recent work that I've, I've been doing is uh, XDG support. Um, I showed you a bunch of YAML files that do configuration. Um, often a single distro will produce multiple ISO images or multiple flavors of the same thing. Um, and it can be nice to uh, just have one set of configuration files for the, for the whole job. Um, so I added uh, better XDG config dears support to Kalamatis so that you can basically write one set of config files and sort of pick and choose bits and pieces of the config files that you want. That's in particular nice for KDE Neon, which produces five or six different ISO images, which are all subtly different. Um, OpenRC support, some distro decided they didn't like systemd, 
and wanted to open our scene. And uh, that actually took a fair amount of polishing to get it to get it right so that it would interoperate properly. But within Calamatas, you can say, we're going to configure systemd or we're going to configure OpenRC. Or you can skip it entirely if you, uh, if you like. Um, I am not going to judge a distro on their init system. Choice is good. Uh, recently, I added app image packaging. Um, I felt kind of weird about doing that because having an installer which is supposed to run as root as an app image seems weird. Um, but in post-delivery situations, so OEM configurations, it may make sense. Because typically, if you've delivered a laptop and it has this click here to configure, after it's configured, you want to get rid of that button. And an app image or a flat pack is easier to get rid of than something that's package installed. Because you can just remove the file and it's gone. So we had quite a long argument about whether or not app image made sense. In the end, we decided, yep, let's do it. Um, I've mentioned uh, OEM mode a couple of times. Uh, there's, uh, there's many improvements to be made there. I'm in conversation with some manufacturers, with some distros to, to figure out what to do exactly there. Um, people ask for scripted mode as well. If you're familiar with any of the Red Hat offerings, you've got all the quick start. You can, you can basically roll out uh, images very easily. Um, it would be nice in some cases to be able to do the same with Kalamatas. And while I don't pretend that we're ever going to be enterprise grade uh, installations, it's good to, ha to work towards that. So that's stuff that's upcoming. Um, I said earlier, we have a I, ha I have a good relationship with, with downstream. I would like you to be downstream as well, or I would like you to be involved in Kalamata's uh, development yourself. Uh, you can uh, find us on the web, on IRC. Uh, feel free to ping me by email or whatever. Um, I do actually spend time labeling issues as help wanted. Um, those are issues that I think are reasonably well con self-contained, have a user visible impact, but aren't hugely uh, hazardous. Uh, so I do encourage new people to contribute. Um, get involved. Thanks for listening. And that was my talk. There's the license on my talk. <laughs> Are there questions? Um, there's a mic. Why don't you spell Calamares with a K? Um, I did not name the, uh, uh, the application. It just happens to be with a C. Maybe you're asking why it's not a K because I'm a KDE person and KDE yes. has this horrible uh, had this horrible naming convention. We go out of our way not to name things with a K anymore. Okay, thank you. I could also say, because I'm not Greek, I don't spell Kalamaris with a K. <laughs> yeah. There was another question over. Just one comment and one question. The comment is that actually systemd came after Oper OpenRC. That's fine. Uh, so, I mean, you started implementing systemd first. That's totally fine, but uh, it should be noted that OpenRC was earlier. Uh, the question is, have you considered setting up a uh, NQSS or some other text console-based installation, uh, installation graphical interface other than the Qt-based one? Um. So the question is, is there a, is there a command line or a text-based version? Um, I've thought about it. That kind of hooks into the scripted mode uh, that I mentioned. Um, da, da, da. It's not high on my priorities list. Um, and, and part of that is simply the UI is written in Qt. 
and it with cute widgets and ripping out the UI layer is is a surprisingly large amount of work. People have asked me, in fact, if I couldn't do a GTK based UI as well. Um, I think it would be possible because the core part is Qt, which uses the glib event loop. So I probably could create GTK widgets on that G glib event loop and, and switch out the UI that way. But that's the kind of terrifying Frankenstein thing that I would gladly leave to someone else. Text mode, on the other hand, I like text mode. Um, it's just not, it hasn't happened yet, and it's fairly low priority. Again, because for the boutique distros with an install CD, um, text mode just feels really old school. I mean, if you're going to end up with it, if you want a text mode installer, you should install FreeBSD or Debian. Does that answer your question? Okay, yes. good. Other questions? Brickbats? None at all? Then I'm done. Thanks for listening. Thanks.